<laughs> into the internet world, you can hear me, I hope, and I'm not just sitting there being muted and just like, you know, like a puppet. So I don't know. Anyway, so uh, we're back on. We're so excited to have y'all here. I'm going to say this one more time. Believe it or not, this is my third time saying this. So I feel like I need to get out our little take thing and say take three. So this is Chelsea Lang, one of another Raleigh artist that we're excited to have in the studio. We also have Madeline Roberts, who is going to be posing for us this evening. Believe it or not, she is also the same person who's the florist who uh, arranged the flowers for two of our painting from lives in the past. Super excited about having her and her husband here this evening who will also be adding to the conversation. So it should be a fun conversation night. Lots of people in here. Sometimes I feel like it's just only about three of us. So we're really excited. If you have any questions, feel free to ask questions. We'll be happy to answer them. Uh, and uh, paint along with us the reference images. Uh, hopefully, Kelly's got them up and running for you, ready to go. You can paint along with us. So, without further ado, we're going to get started uh, for the third time. So, believe it or not, we already had a few lines on some of our canvases. All right, we'll catch <laughs> y'all. We'll start and ready to go. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. You know, it wouldn't be a painting from life. I felt like <clears throat> it was too good to be true that I was getting everything perfectly ready to go. And um, I thought I had all my ducks in a row. And of course, we had like a tiny glitch at the beginning. Um, but wouldn't be a painting from life if it didn't happen. All right. So Chelsea, this is the this is the, you know, pat your head and rub your belly situation. So I'm Perfect. going to start throwing questions at you while you concentrate on trying to block in the painting. <laughs> per Perfect that's, timing. That's how we roll, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because the blocking is the part where you think the least, right? Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so tell us about yourself. Are oh, you originally from Raleigh? I am, born, born and bred, as they say. Um, yeah, I, the furthest away I have lived is either Chapel Hill or Southern Pines, depending on what you count. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you uh, know Carmen Gordon or know who that oh, is? Oh, yes. I, um, I painted with Carmen when I was in Southern Pines, actually. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Were you there studying? Yes. Okay. Just for a summer uh, as a break from college, actually. Okay, awesome. Where'd you, where'd you go to school? UNC Chapel Hill. I studied psychology and Spanish. I took like one whole art class or one whole semester's worth anyway and said, oh, wow, I'm going to study art some other way. <laughs> Got a completely unrelated degree. <laughs> I love it. All right, I might have to change my camera angle a little bit. We were just talking about how Madeline has this like lovely pre-Raphaelite uh, look on her, um, uh, has the pre-Raphaelite look. And um, we were talking about how uh, it's one of those things where we start throwing out art terms and forget that not everybody knows art terms, <laughs> you know? So, but she does have that lovely look and they said they left and went back home and they're like, oh, we need to look that up. <laughs> but she was sitting here waiting for us to get ready and um, the pose that she was sitting in, we were like, wow, that's, she doesn't have a bad angle. <laughs> So two comments that I wanted to read were uh, first Ruby Ruby says the mime was quite entertaining. I think that's you, Lewis. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, Gary Laparle, I think that's the last name, says Chelsea in all caps with spaces in between the letters and like uh, seven exclamation marks. Oh my gosh. Hi, Gary. <laughs> that's surreal. Thanks for watching. Uh, sounds like we need to have Gary on. <laughs> Gary is one of my um, one of my students. Oh, awesome! I, I check in with Gary every week. Oh, sweet. Oh, nice. Okay. 
So is he like a, a remote student or is he? Yep, I, uh, I do all of my teaching work online, mm -hmm. um, starting with a lot of YouTube videos. And then I, I work with a group of students uh, several times a week over Zoom. Oh, awesome. Awesome. How long have you been doing that since since the pandemic started? Yep. Or, yep. Yeah. Transitioned from um, working with artists in person to going online. So it's like weirdly fortuitous timing because yeah. I wanted to just make that switch for a while, actually. Um, but it's cool. It's great being able to work with artists from like all over the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's pretty stinking awesome. Technology has been great as far as that's concerned. It allows us to do what we do here, you know? Yeah. Um, which has been pretty amazing. You know, the YouTube has changed everything too, I feel like. Yeah. So um, it's made it pretty awesome. So it sounds to me from what we were saying earlier, that you have other hobbies or interests as well. Yes. Which I find to be the case a lot of times for artists that um, they're, they're sort of multifaceted of, of having multiple interests, not just one. So tell us about it. What, where, what are you also into? Oh my gosh. Okay. So pre-pandemic, by a few years, I uh, was a competitive Latin ballroom dancer. Um, awesome. <laughs> it taught me a lot about how to work towards your goals in um, really concrete ways and, dis and distill something as like nebulous and abstract as painting or dancing into mm. tangible hard skills um, that you can actually work on developing. Um, and then unfortunately dancing inside isn't the best activity right now with a partner. Um, so I have gotten back into dressage. So horse dancing for anyone who, for whatever reason, doesn't follow that particular Olympic sport and has no idea what that word means. <laughs> That's awesome. Where, where do you do that? You do it somewhere around in Raleigh? Yeah. Um, the farm I ride at is actually like up, up Creedmoor Road. Um, it's a really awesome facility, actually. Um, super beautiful. I'm excited to take some reference there once the weather is a little less depressing. Mm -hmm. um, way back when, when I was a, a wee lad, I, um, I had my own horses. I <gasps> loved having them. Tell me everything. Well, I, there's not much to tell. I, you know, probably from when I was... Uh, about six to 13, I was the only one that was really interested at that time in horses. Um, and my grandfather um, basically had like a barn and pasture. And he was like, I'll get horses if you promise to take care of them. So uh, I did, he did get them and I, I rode them, you know, fed them, rode them, you know, every other day and, and took lessons, but they were basic. It was just English saddle lesson. Nice. Um, and uh, my horse's name was John Boy. Oh my, oh my gosh, I love it. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome, John Boy. John Boy, and we, we had another horse that I didn't ride him, and um, we called him Red, because he was just red, you know, yeah. real creative. <laughs> so, I tell you, they get creative with the names though, like when you go to a horse yeah. race, you know, it's, it, hearing some of their names you're like okay some some people have been really thinking about this yeah it's interesting with like the jockey club <laughs> this is going to turn into a totally different kind of stream <laughs> it's okay they they have restrictions you can't have a horse with the same name twice and there's so many thoroughbreds that are bred every year to race that you really do have to come up with unusual original names at this point um how did you how did you get into it were brought up on it? Um, yeah, it was just something I was super into as a kid. I think my family probably wished that I didn't get into <laughs> such a like expensive sport, but I uh, I was just like crazy about it and sort of didn't ever stop talking about it until I got to take take lessons. 
Oh, that's awesome. And uh, I've been kind of been at it ever since. Mm. Um, so I went to boarding school in my younger years and my, my, my two brothers, it was a military school in Indiana and we had a huge horse program. Uh, they called them the black horse troop. Um, and they were in the troop and I really wanted to be in it. But um, when I went to school there, we had, it was like a little bit extra and, you know, I was just fortunate to be able to go yeah. <laughs> at that time. So, um, but um, I rode when I could, they had like a rough riders program and we had a big polo team and oh, my brother cool. played polo there, but um, it was a lot of fun to watch. I have never done anything like polo. I feel like that must be a really, really cool thing to get into. Yeah. Um, it's a lot. Of, it's a lot of fun. I got out there one, once or twice with some friends and I was like, okay, this is a lot harder than, <laughs> than looks. You're like out, uh, you know, you're, you're sitting on the sidelines and you're like, oh, that, that was like fun. It wouldn't be too hard. I think I could pick that up. And you get out there and you're like, no. I I can't imagine making contact with the mallet and the actual ball, like while on a galloping horse, like yeah. absolutely not. <laughs> it's pretty scary. Pretty scary. Now, do you have any brothers or sisters? Just me. Just you. Yeah. Now I see that you're using a Strata um, Pashad box. Mm -hmm. Do you like it? I do. I actually am pretty new to using it. It's, it is exclusively my travel box. So I have an edge that sits on my desk at home. Um, and yeah, it, I, at one point I just wanted something that I thought would be like a little bit more lightweight. Mm -hmm. um, I really like both of them, but have enjoyed just having, having some different options. And something I can easily kind of just keep in my car in case I ever was coming over to East Oaks yeah, was and was like, say, you know in what? Case you were just like thinking about <laughs> painting it, painting from life. <laughs> hmm, that's awesome. We do have some questions from the audience, uh, both about uh, toning the canvases. So one person says, "What colors are you using to tone your canvases?" Uh, that's from uh, Leah, and then Harzart. Uh, says, I've, I've, I have a question. Do you use any mediums like oil or turpentine to tone your canvas uh, and while painting? Um, right now, I'm actually, uh, as far as toning is concerned, I used um, uh, French ultramarine and oxide red and uh, just used a bit of turp. I, I used Gamsol and uh, basically just kind of add them onto the, the panel. And then once I've added them, just like a little small dollop, and it's usually about two, two parts of ultramarine to one part um, oxide red. And I just kind of mix them around with, with a bit of the Gamsol, and then I wipe them away with uh, Viva paper towels. And, and basically I can get all the way to almost a neutral all the way to something that feels decently warm. I end up kind of usually going more towards something warm, but that's usually my approach with toning. Yeah, and uh, mine is this raw umber, just some cheap Windsor Newton raw umber, and then mix with a little bit of black put some on there and then I usually have a brush with a bit of turp and then I'll wipe it away with paper towel and then Chelsea doesn't have it. Yeah I, I typically like to go in with a 
Gamsol wash at the very beginning so that everything is very wet. So I'm not so much staining the canvas as like really just putting on an initial layer that will provide a little bit of tone, um, but also give a slightly slicker surface. But I've been playing with doing like this dry brush block in um, and doing everything on just the white of the canvas, which um, let me tell you, it was like a really smart challenge for coming in and painting with like here here in the big leagues. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that goes, but it is something like new that I'm playing with. But typically I would do a very similar tone, but I would do it um, like right at the beginning of the session. So it would be very wet versus doing that as a part of like preparing the ground. Mm -hmm. Big leaks. Did you see how <laughs> bad it was getting started with YouTube? I feel like mine looks a bit like Weird Al Yankovic at the moment. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Going for pre <laughs> Oh, that's what you said. Okay. <laughs> we got it here, Susie. Here it is. It's been a while since I've heard that name. Yeah. So Chelsea, it was only like what, like a year or two ago that you decided to to switch to full time painting. Is that yeah, is that correct? Right. Yeah. Uh, you want to I don't know talk about that transition? Yeah. Um, one, I, I mean, am incredibly fortunate that this is like where where life has brought me. To be perfectly frank, um, but it didn't take long of me being out of college, which was twenty twelve being in the workforce to realize like, oh man, um, I've made a terrible mistake. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and really spent like 2012 to 2017 trying to figure out like how to build up, um, you know, a business as a painter and give myself some runway. Um, and it was, really the end of 2019 when I realized, okay, you know, I have enough commissions that I know are scheduled for the coming year. Um, I think we can do this. <laughs> and my, my first day of being full time was January 1st, 2020, which I guess if, um, if you can make it in 2020, you can, yeah, yeah, you can like fight through and make it <laughs> anytime. So it's been an interesting adventure, but it's it's required a lot of like adapting and being nimble right off the mm. bat. Um, but it's it's been awesome. I've been super grateful for it. Well, uh, excited for us to talk more about that. We're about yeah. to get we're about ten seconds away from a break. So everybody, we're gonna uh, break for just a sec. Give about five minutes. Um, for our model to rest, and we will be back uh, shortly. Perfect, looks like you nailed it. We just might have her back. We always say we, we, we want to have our models back once they once they first model because they do such an incredible job, but then they realize how hard it is. And they're like, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> Come on back. No. Don't call me, I'll call you. <laughs>
So I had a, this is the, the model's husband with another inane question. Um, since you guys had used that phrase um, so much pre-Raphaelite to describe, I was just wondering, like, is that something that is um, front of mind when you're painting, like you are working to capture that style or do you kind of have to put it out of your mind and just try to capture the subject as she is in front of you? Um, ooh. I'm going to just like toss that up to Alex. What do you think, buddy? Mm, um, I would say that yeah, when I have a model and I feel like they're giving off that essence, I would keep it in mind to try and try and harness some of that in my painting. Whereas I could see how some people would probably want to get it out. But no, yeah. I'm really hoping I can capture a Pyrephalite feeling in this. It's when, for me, it's like when you see it, it inspires you to want to like capture that, that thing. It's not often that I paint um, in the subject matter of pre-Raphaelite, but it's like, since she sort of has that feeling, kind of like you want to capture those things that give the element or the elements of that feeling, you know? So how, how her hair, you know, the sort of the wave of her hair and you know the fairness of her skin and those kinds of things that you see in those paintings like those are things i want to like try to capture because i feel like they're they're not only a part of her identity but have a tradition tied to them they most certainly don't have to yeah i find that when you when you have a sense of the style of the piece going in, or more specifically, when you can look at your reference and you know what the final painting should look like, it's so much easier to take it all the way to the conclusion versus when I look at the model and I just think like, okay, there's a model and I don't see the painting in her yet. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Sometimes trying to find the painting is so hard. Um, you know, it's, there's sometimes where it's like, oh, that one little thing is beautiful, but you might not know how you paint that because you have to translate it somehow in paint and trying to, part of the fun of it is the discovery, but also part of the, the frustration is, is trying to figure it out. So. Right. I'm surprised that there's not more people giving questions. Are there any questions, um, Nick? Oh, we don't have really any questions. Um, I mean, some, <laughs> uh, we, we do have a Vimala, Vimala says, thank, uh, thanks for doing the demo. Uh, Thelina Kathalwa says, hi, I'm from Sri Lanka. Here it's 5 a.m. in the morning. Uh, guys, if you can please visit my country. <laughs> so, you know, take East Oaks on the road. Or I guess that's... You wouldn't really be able to do it on a road, but you know you have to fly there. But uh, you know, once we once we have a bigger budget, and East Oaks road trip um, or boat trip, road trip, flight trip, <laughs> plane trip, I'll do it all. Sounds like fun. Uh, we just need to find some funders. Um, <laughs> start our own GoFundMe page. We'll travel to a city near you. That was a mistake.
Kevin Evans uh, asks, what mediums uh, do you use, if at all, uh, brand of paints? Um, so mediums, I'm using uh, Chelsea Studios um, Lean Oil, which is basically a lavender oil or stack oil, some people call it. Um, and the the paints that I usually use are more often than not Old Holland or Michael Harding. And I have a few natural pigments colors on here, uh, like lead white and vermilion. Um, but for the most part, I'm using oxide red, French, or ultramarine blue, um, uh, cobalt blue, blizzard crimson, manganese violet, and, um, and Naples yellow. And that's, that's pretty much it. Um, I have black for like near the final stages for if I want to like add just a, a hint or an accent of something. Is everybody else using paints and mediums? The medium I'm using right now is half linseed and half gamsol. And Mostly any painting of mine that you look at, that's probably the medium I'm using mostly all the way through. Um, and yeah, the, the paint brands that I usually use are Rublev, um, what's it called? Old Holland, and then I have like a couple Michael Harding colors, or maybe just one actually. But yeah, those are my go-tos. I see you have Primalba on your tabaret there. Is that your white of choice? Well, it used to be. Um, now I use it mostly just for a la prima stuff. Um, but now I've been using Rublev lead white number two. Nice. Yeah, but a lot of a lot of my you know paintings from a year or two ago were done in all Primalba which I really do like because I even used a half lead, half titanium from Rublev and it still destroyed my color like more than Permalba. Hmm. Permalba is just like, works more like lead. So, yeah. How do you prevent your, your medium mixture from separating or have you ever had that happen? Cause sometimes when I do like Gamsol and linseed, I will find the fat like hardens into a layer and I'm yeah. never actually confident that it's correctly mixed. mixed. Yeah, I don't know if it's a, I usually get, there's some hard sticky stuff at the bottom, but I just try and before I use it every time to shake it up a bit, but really nothing. <laughs> I could just be using like pure linseed right now. Like maybe all of the yeah. turp is evaporated out or something. It's what I used to do until I like just wasn't confident that I wasn't just painting straight with solvent yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. and then switch to um, Olea gel, which has been great. And I have like the Gamblin alternative to it and who like that as well. Is that the solvent free gel? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to use solvent free gel a lot. I liked it. It, it had a, just a slight different property to it that um, I actually think that in some instances I like better. Uh, especially if I'm glazing. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah. But it's one of those things where it's, you know, um, both work if people are asking me what they need to go get. Yeah. But if you're getting to a place of like trying to do things subtly, there's tiny little shifts might make a difference. But for the most part, like you can try both, just find out what you like, you know, yeah. um, and go from there. Typically just have fun experimenting. Yeah, I think people get super concerned with like doing it right and right. having all the right things and right. having the right archival process. And I know so many great painters who are just like, I don't know, just sit down and paint. I'm like, okay, if that <laughs> attitude was good enough for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I have a buddy. We all went on this like fishing bachelor party trip where we went fly fishing. And we like, you know, hired a guide and we, we all went out and uh, he came 
and he had the setup. I mean, he had the, the crazy expensive rod and had every lure that in, in fly ever made. And he had like the perfect hat and the perfect vest and everything. He gets out there and for three days straight caught bubkas, just like <laughs> nothing. And everybody else is like, it's just like they cast and just like pull out this huge trout. And he's just like, what's going on? And he's trying to do all this tr fancy stuff. And he'd never really spent much time. He was, all of us were just amateurs, you know, but um, it just goes to show, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter with all the bells and whistles when you're really trying to start out uh, from the very beginning. So we have uh, some more questions. Uh, so uh, let's see. Bruce says or asks, uh, what's the best question someone else asked during a workshop you were taking uh, that you wouldn't have considered or uh, asked but learned from? Uh, someone asked the artist, what brush are you using? And that just changed my life. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> or like what two colors did you use to make that mixture? Yeah. Yeah. It's like a little bit of red, a little bit of yellow, and a little <laughs> bit of blue. No, I don't know. But I all I know is I especially when I was taking workshops, I was like super shy, so I was not the one asking questions. So I kind of relied on everyone else's everyone else's questions, but I cannot remember a specific one. So I was checking something. What what exactly was the question? Was it a workshop that you wish you would go to, and um, what would be the question you would ask in that workshop? Is that or like what has someone ever asked a, a really really great question? Presumably when you were teaching a workshop oh, where you're like, oh, gotcha. that's a great question. Gotcha. Um, well, <laughs> I'll tell you what I tell a lot of people in the class is there are no bad questions, but I might have a really bad answer. <laughs> <laughs> so be prepared. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I, the questions that I love people asking that I think are, are more of the questions that are pertaining to and related to how to push something to feel more poetic. And it's, so it's a more of a philosophical decision making versus technical. And I think the only reason is because most of the time when you're in a workshop, you're teaching technical. And so it's just a break from what people are asking, honestly. So it doesn't mean that it's a better question, but um, why I would choose to make a mark a certain way versus another, you know, is an, is an example, or why I would use a, a transparent paint versus a, a pet, opaque one. What's the decision behind that and why, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. Um, because I think that that starts getting down to the heart of it doesn't matter if you're painting hyper realistic or if you're painting very loose. Uh, and it's more about like how, you know, without sounding too, too cliche, it's more about how, what you want to say and how you, what you enjoy painting and what you find to be beautiful. I don't know if I'm answering that question right, but hey, that's that's my answer. <laughs> so I'm gonna stick to it. Well, we do have some other questions. Uh, so Leia uh, asks, okay, since we're on the subject of pre-Raphaelites, have you ever used a Verdaccio underpainting? I have not. I don't think so. Um, trying to think like I know I've read a little bit about their process but it sounded super like just I couldn't make good sense of it like I've heard stuff about 
they'd paint passages in just like pure white. And then once the painting got to a certain level of dryness, they would then like paint on top of the pure white, but it wouldn't be dry. It wasn't like glazing. That sounds like Bob Ross's approach to painting where he started the piece with like white on the whole canvas and- <laughs> Like wet white? Yeah. Oh shit, Bob Ross. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah Bob, that old didn't... Bob doing some pre-Raphaelite stuff, <laughs> didn't even know it. I love Bob. <laughs> I will say this about him, you know, he, he had, he was quite captivating, you know, he knew how to grab an audience. Um, and I, I have my, I was with my little nephews not too long ago and we put Bob Ross on and these guys have like extreme energy. They're like, you know, nine or uh, yeah, it's like seven and nine. And I turned on Bob Ross and like within seconds they had, were sitting still <laughs> like dead quiet and just like, like hypnotized by it. I was like, man, if I could ever get to that point, that's awesome. Uh, I, I have painted um, grisailles where the underpainting is, I'm using pure white. Um, I can't say that I necessarily, I've, I feel like there's only one painting I've done that I was relatively successful at it because I think it takes practice. Um, and I enjoyed the process, but the processes I do now, I enjoy more but it was a fun learning experience. Uh, and I did about four, four or five paintings that had a similar process, but the impasto of like the white wasn't necessarily what I think they're going for what you were talking about, Alex. You know, uh, it was more of just the underpainting being solely about um, getting the value, I guess, keyed brighter than the next layer. Um, yeah, what I was saying had nothing to do with impasto. It was, it was just that it would be pure okay. white paint that was wet that they would paint oh, okay. like on top of. Or so it was wet, not dry. Yeah, not dry. Okay, yeah. No, I had not done it where it's still wet. I always waited till it dried. And it was sort of like a glazing process on top of that. Yeah. Is anyone chiming in with like what, what that process actually looks like? Yeah, because we're all probably... <laughs> yes. Wrong. No, I don't see anybody. Oh, I'm calling us out on us being idiots. Please, please do. I, I, I think I only know that there is one painter that I can think of, although I can't remember his name, uh, who does paint uh, with the Verdaccio. Um, but yeah, I, I don't remember his name. But yeah, it's it's a it's definitely an interesting technique. I, I'm I'm not sure like what the benefits are of it, but um, yeah. I think it is one that like goes back to before oil paint when people were using more like egg tempera uh, and it has something to do with the transparencies there, but I, that's all I know. I am a sucker for transparencies. Is the light on us versus her keyed such that we can hold it up or is it gonna be way brighter under you, here? I believe you are brighter. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So Thank you. you might want to key your painting brighter in a way because yeah. um, what I have found is when we're filming, we, we, we make it bright enough for the cameras to see well, <laughs> but then like later you, you take it in normal light and you're like, this is so dark, <laughs> you know? So definitely keep that in mind. Yeah, I learned the critical mistake of my setup. I can't tell if Alex is in better shape, but I know you're in great shape. I catch every bit of glare coming off here. So I keep like looking at my mixture oh, from over yeah. here. Uh, step back one, no, uh, oh. you can step your whole easel back one foot and that'll take the glare off. Okay, awesome. I'll, yeah. I'll do that during the break. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll readjust the break. It's not too far away. So first off, uh, we, we do have a, somebody Googled Verdaccio. And so just for those of you who may not have seen the chat, I guess the, the definition or at least the what they found on Google is Verdaccio is a greenish underpainting technique used by early Italian fresco painters. The artist establishes all the values in the underpainting technique 
Several trans transparent over uh, over paintings are then applied, achieving a realistic a realistic skin toned painting that glows. So, for those of you out there who are wondering what that is, that's Verdaccio. Um, but we do have some other questions. Uh, so, uh, did you use lead white or titanium white, and which one do you prefer, and why? Uh, today, I'm actually using a mixture of the two. Uh, I'm using a lead white and titanium white, and that's just because I'm being cheap. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I, I like both, um, but I cut them quite often because I like the properties of lead white. Um, but um, titanium has, it, it's slightly brighter and so if I'm doing an alla prima painting, I feel like it works better for when I'm kind of working in the wet um, to have that as part of the aid. Well, all of y'all jumped in at once. Oh yeah, there's a question. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of answered it with the Permaba, but oh, I, that's true, yeah. I use, Right now I'm using Permaba, which is, I'm pretty sure, titanium and zinc, um, which zinc is supposedly not good. Um, but I like to use lead white now. Um, lead white number two by Ruth Love. And it's a lot of my main issues that why I choose certain paints is how fast they dry and lead white dries faster. And I like that. Mm. Um, and then it just looks, even when it, if I have like a pile of lead white and a pile of titanium white or permaba on my palette next to each other and they both dry, the lead white just looks like this buttery rich mm -hmm. pigment and the titanium kind of just dries more chalky looking. So mm. I just think it looks better overall. That's interesting. I really haven't had any like teachers or sort of guidance that's like pushed me toward lead white for just what I've been interested in. So I, I think I've technically tried it, but it's been so long ago that I have no memory of what it was like to paint with it. So it's titanium all the way over here. There you go. What brand? Um, I am painting with Williamsburg. Um, if it were still a thing, or maybe it's a thing again, I would have probably done like the Lafranc white since that was Richard yeah, Schmidt's go to. Mm -hmm. It just sounds cool. Right? I just want to be able to do it just because yeah. it's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really add to the the like workshop experience yes yeah, exactly yeah use use terms just to sound cool of course i mean that's why we bust out all the anatomy knowledge yeah, right, when we talk right. about painting exactly. from pre-raphaelite <laughs> yeah why, why else are we saying that word over and over again oh, that was not the right color on a related note, Alex Tabbitt uh, says, hey, Alex, why have you strayed from using Pernalba White in your studio work? I don't know if he meant it that dramatic, but I don't know the word strayed. It seems, it seems like he's really disappointed in you. That's, that's how I'm reading it. Uh, yeah, I guess because of what I just said about how it looks when it dries. Um, that's really it. It just it just looks nicer to me than than the Permalba. But a lot of paintings that I've done that I really liked were done with Permalba and they look fine. So it's just it has a better flow, just little subtle things that's made me change. But if I was like there's no more lead white in the world, I would probably use the Permalba. We 
we also have a question. Uh, is it okay to paint first layers without oil uh, with some thickness, then use glazing layers over uh, and over it? All right, we're going to take a break, and uh, I'll go ahead and answer that question, but you can go ahead, uh, Madeline, and relax for a bit. Um, so what was the question again? Uh, it, it was a question about, like, uh, painting initially with kind of thicker layers and then glazing into it, I, I guess, compared to maybe some of the academic things where they will put in, like, very thin washes in the beginning, maybe? Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, as far as if, I, if I'm painting in layers and it's it dries, you know, I'm, I'm allowing it to dry like it's not a la prima, then, yes, I'll... Uh, I actually will use the underpainting as a layer to do opaque and transparent colors while it also being a value uh, thing. It won't necessarily be black and white, but it will be some sort of form of uh, less color. And it'll be more about the value being higher and lower. And then, and usually that's where I'll paint thicker. And then um, I most certainly the next layer will even sometimes paint even more thick in the lights. And then the final layer I'll glaze and do thin um, after that. But between each layer, I let it dry uh, doing that process. So uh, we'll ask everybody else what they think on that next question uh, uh, after this break. All right, we're back. Um, does anybody feel like also answering that last question too on what y'all do? It's been a hundred years since yes. we took a break. <laughs> <laughs> what was the question again? <laughs> Nick, that's your cue. Uh, so the question uh, was, is it okay to paint first layers without oil with some thickness then using glazing layers over, in, uh, over it? I'm disqualified from answering this question. <laughs> Why are you disqualified? Because <laughs> I, I only paint all of Prima. <laughs> <laughs> or at least directly. Um, it's, I know that, like, technically, you know, it's the fat over lean um, rule, but I think if the painting is dry enough, and I use very little oil in the first layer, and I use a lot of oil in the next layer, but it's dry enough, yeah, I've done that many times. Nothing bad's happened yet. The painting police didn't come after you? Okay. Darn painting police, man. But watch out for those guys. We have some more questions. Uh, Thelina says uh, or asks, any thoughts about watercolor paintings of William Adolf Bouguereau, Andrew Zorn, and Nick Alm, they use watercolor like oil painting. Any tips or thoughts about that approach? Uh, you know, it's interesting because uh, there's such different properties to the two of them. You know, one, so you're, you're operating with uh, full on transparency using the white from the, from the, you know, from the paper and it's about thinness and, and layering to dark versus, you know, just the opposite. You're layering to light typics uh, often with oil. That's not always the case with oil, you know, but um, I, I've done both. I don't necessarily find myself um, taking the approach that they're of trying to paint them the same. What I'm maybe what I'm wondering is maybe what you're saying is is that the feeling of the paintings, both watercolor and oil, are consistent with how the artist artist's uh, aesthetic looks. So uh, that's what I'm thinking you're 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 going for. Um, so I have a huge respect for that because that's not easy to do because they're such different mediums. So um, if you can if you can do that, I think that it actually adds to the depth of you as an artist.
this one little bit thing and then start really working on the portrait. Yeah, actually <laughs> do the thing I'm supposed to do, which is like completely avoiding it right now. We're just painting hair and clothes today, right? We're not. <laughs> I was painting that gray backdrop yeah. earlier. It was great. <laughs> Hars Art has a question. Uh, what uh, what do you think about uh, what is said about the warm light casts cool shadows, cool light casts warm shadows? Um, what I would say to, to that, does anyone else want to answer? Because I, yeah, here, let me let somebody else go. Very Richard Schmidt, you would do. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. That's a classic mistake, assuming I have a great answer to this question. Um, what I will say really briefly is that I've seen people do demonstrations where they basically debunk it. And like you will have certain conditions and like standard outdoor lighting scenarios where that's true, but it's not like an inherent property of the light. Mm -hmm. um, Granted, please jump in if, if you have a better understanding of that piece. But as a result, I've just tried to say, okay, what, what color is it? Yeah. <laughs> just go yeah. from there. Right. Uh, I would agree to that, that um, in a lot of art, the, I give the attorney answer that it depends. <laughs> um, but in, in most scenarios, what I would I would say is that color and really color theory is all about relationships. A color doesn't necessarily exist on its own without being associated to a color next to it. And there's so much about what we do that is creating an illusion and translating what we see in life to be uh, to to make sense when we visually see something on canvas. And we have a lot of limitations of what you can and can't do. On a flat surface so we push different properties to create this illusion or understanding of something that might feel entertaining to our eye and in that nature you could say that that is a good like rule of thumb to think about because what you're doing is trying to create separation between your shadow and your light however it doesn't necessarily mean that it is always true because you could have an environment that is red and you could have the shadow would then create uh, an ambience of red uh, would be bounced into the shadow. And then in the light, you would also have a warm tone. And if you like did a teardrop like in Photoshop on all of the different tones, the entire painting actually would be keyed red. It would just be cooler reds in the light and warmer reds in the shadow. So, um, so it's still it's still warm and cool, but they're all warm because they're all red, you know. So uh, there's a there's a sergeant painting that I'm thinking of of a lady reclining and she's like in a red dress with a red background, and those properties most certainly play a role in that piece. So. And that's my thought, and I'm sticking to it. Yeah, I've noticed anytime anyone gets like too into the formula of their painting, like things start to really go mm -hmm. haywire. But I'm, I know there are absolutely exceptions to that. No, nope, terrible mistake. Terrible. <laughs> You're supposed to say I meant to do that <laughs> just to show you what not to do. That's right. Man, okay. How are we going to fix that? <laughs> Selena asks, are you guys using canvas panels for this portrait? Alex, your voice is very low. I don't know if that's like a, a compliment of like your baritone voice or if it's your mic. Uh, uh, 
and says, uh, thank you guys for doing this. Love you all. There we go. I think we're all working on different, all working on something different, our surface, because mine is a panel with uh, acrylic gesso, and then Louis probably using red, mm -hmm. and you've got something fancy over there. <laughs> you got something fancy over there. It's, it's a Raymar, I think, C13 double primed. I told you it was fancy. Okay. <laughs> I'm really just lazy. Like my panel is just a lazy panel. No, yeah. <laughs> I'm yep. Um, Raymar is a great company. It's uh, Emily, who runs and owns that company, is one of my really dear friends, really close friends. So she always happy to promote her stuff. Nice. Saves time to have them already done for you. Yeah. More time to paint. So Chelsea, a few minutes ago, you mentioned that uh, that you paint uh, a la prima, or at least always uh, wet and wet. Uh, are, are you using the exact same process you would use for like a larger, more complex painting, or, or how does that differ based off of scale and time restrictions? Yeah. Okay, so there's, there's about three answers to this question. Um, one is that I actually quite like painting small. It was something that it took me a while to understand that when I looked at my favorite painters, I often really preferred their studies and their smaller pieces. And it took me a long time to kind of give myself permission to just say, oh, okay, so that's what I'm gonna do. Um, so I don't often paint especially large. Um, if I were painting large and I wanted to keep it all a prima, I might section the piece off, but that's a very hypothetical answer. Um, and I would say the difference in my approach maybe today versus any other day is honestly um, kind of depends on if I hit a wall and I need to come back to it another day. <laughs> mm. um, that's really the only time I would still say I'm painting directly, but I'm not painting wet into wet, for instance, at that point. Um, unless I just get lucky and things are still a little tacky the next day. But... I like trying to keep to one sitting when possible. And so I paint accordingly, but there's really no like kind of magic to that answer. There's no sophisticated technique involved. It's just, I've sort of learned how I like to work. So if you come back to something, mm -hmm. is that not indirect if it's dry? Uh, so I would still consider it direct, just not all a prima, because it's like not all in one sitting, but I'm not intentionally layering, like, and that, that's sort so of the distinction. Like in literally mind. paint over it fully where the layer didn't influence the next layer. Correct. Yes. Um, I'm now terrified that I have a fundamental misunderstanding of direct versus indirect, but, <laughs> um, oh, it's okay. but that's how I like to paint. That, like, that, that's good. And it's good clarity for people to know that that's what what you're saying and how in how you like to paint. Yeah, I think when we had uh, Jesus Villarreal here, um, I guess just over a year ago, uh, he said something like, you know, he paints uh, directly. And he says, you know, when he comes back for another session, he, he just keeps painting as if it, I, I guess he can't just paint as if it's wet and wet, but I, I do remember him saying that like, he doesn't, I guess, think in layers, he kind of treats it all as one layer and how he paints things over. He's not, yeah, I, I don't know, which I, I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah, that's, that's definitely, that sounds like the same way that I think about it. Um, and sometimes I'll like oil out or something to try and recreate the conditions of painting wet into wet or at least the surface texture, um, even if I'm not getting like paint interaction.
we have a, a I think a somewhat related question. Uh, Deb Hoffner says, using the linseed oil and Gamsol mix for glazing layers, have you ever had a problem with paint not fully drying and staying tacky to the touch after many weeks? Mm, no, I don't think after many weeks I've ever had something still wet and tacky. Um, there's certain pigments that that happens with or if I'm using, um, what's it called, oleo gel, I feel like if I use too much of it, it stays wet. And then there's certain, there's certain colors that when I use a cheaper brand, they just like never dry. So like certain alizarin, alizarin crimsons and stuff like that, just I'll pick up my painting like two weeks later and it'll still be wet. So it could be something to do with the pigment you're glazing. Mm -hmm. but for the specific medium that is just half and half it shouldn't be that unless even if you were using a lot of it i don't think so maybe if you're using a lot a lot of it it would yeah just be like tacky medium on your on your painting so yeah either the pigment or too much medium Sounds like a, a solid answer to me. The only time I've ever had a painting like where it just took forever to dry is I put like a load of a certain type of titanium white that um, a brand that I didn't know much about and it just stayed for it literally mm. took like three weeks for it to actually not for it, for it to actually dry. So um, I don't remember what the brand was, but. That was years and years and years ago. Are you in position? Yeah. Cool. So, a question. Um, So a question from Kevin Evans. I saw an earlier video of the pyodormant plastic, plastics aluminium panels. I got my, I got some myself. Thanks for the tip. I'm actually in Raleigh too. Oh, nice. What's your, what was the person's name? Uh, Kevin Evans. You said I Kevin? Think. Yeah. That's awesome, Kevin. Um, makes me happy to know and um, glad you're in Raleigh. Alex. Ken Garcia says, what's up, Alex? What's up, Ken? OK, 
Ken's my boy from back from Virginia Beach. From the hood. From the hood. <laughs> One of the first workshops I took was from Ken. It was a a Caravaggio master painting. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, master copy class. Which would have been my absolute dream class back then. Because I loved Caravaggio. Mm. Okay, I want to turn a question back on you too, which is that if you are going to be in some kind of workshop environment with any painter, living or dead, what question would you love to ask? <laughs> what palette he uses. That's what, you, that's what you do for Zorin, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, actually, that would be a good question because he'd probably be like, oh, yeah, that picture you're all referencing, <laughs> that is not what you think it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. God, you fooled. I really don't know. What question I would ask him? What the hell, man? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, we just really want to watch watch it happen. That's it's real. Funny. Yeah. That's, that's, so it, you know, it's one of those I have to like actually think about that I'll come up with the answer like like while running or something. Right, yeah. <laughs> you know? We'll just save that yeah. for Next time. In the shower, during shower thoughts. <laughs> what about you? Do you have that? No, I, I am falling prey to the exact same thing. I just selfishly wanted to know what you two would would say to that. I would just like to know, like, what artist would you take if you could take the workshop? Just which one would it be? You know? Sergeant. Sergeant. And, like, Richard Schmidt, too. Yeah. Mm. Zorn. Yep. You know. Actually, Chelsea, speaking of Richard Schmid, you, I feel like, were you there like a year ago, not with Richard Schmid, but, but like Scott and Susan painting up where they were? I think I saw that. But I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was like blown away when I found out that Scott and Sue actually lived nearby. And as soon as I knew that, I was like, okay, I don't Richard. care. <laughs> like, I'm going to, I'm going to go pick their brains and hear all about like how they work and what awesome takeaways they had. And that was kind of just like one of the big goals that I made for myself was like, I want to learn from all the people who got to learn from, you know, this, one of my like most favorite painters. That's awesome. Were there something in particular that you were asking being around them? Nothing like, oh my gosh, my whole painting world has just been revolutionized. Yeah. yeah. But there were just little things in terms of like how their ways of painting differed from Richard's and like what he would have said about, you know, mm. the ways that they worked. Like I know for one, Scott talked about his palette and how like <laughs> Richard would have had like an aneurysm looking at <laughs> looking at his palette. Um, but I think it just goes to show that, you know, you can like have this amazing influence or teacher and still like wildly vary from the way that they worked. And, you know, like I think sometimes we get super locked into the way we're supposed to do things. Mm -hmm. And I think it can like really hold us back. Um, and I also just got this like really lovely impression from listening to the way they spoke about Richard that 
I don't know, painting just seemed like this truly joyful thing mm -hmm. for him. And uh, that just made me really happy and made me want to figure out like, how can I bring that into my painting practice, no matter mm -hmm. <laughs> what mood I might be in about my work. Yep. Yeah. Um, I love them just because they're just so real. They're honest they, and they're unapologetic, even if they're having a bad day and they're okay just t saying, look, take the risk, just get, just do it, you know, because um, Susan often talks about like how, you know, she's constantly for years had like the fear of getting like on camera or demoing it like, you know, portrait society or whatever the thing is, mm -hmm. you know, and then find in and, and her, you know, Scott's like, just do it, just do it, just do it, just do it. And then finally she just got to the point. She's like, yeah, I just don't care anymore. I'm just going to do it. Yeah. I mean, well, she does still care. That's what she's saying. She's fighting against him. But, um, but she's bold enough and over time continuing to, to put her best foot forward of getting out there. And I'm so glad she does because she's such an incredible painter and so many people can learn from her. And, um, you know, she's inspiring many people like, like you. Yeah. So, um, yeah. That was actually a really big takeaway um, that I had was kind of like, I need to stop waiting for someone to just tell me that I can do this as a living yep. or that I've like reached this magical threshold where my work is good enough. Um, and I kind of just need to treat. You never need to just reach the magical threshold. Right. Because you never will. Yep. You know, so that's, that's so good that you finally came to a conclusion that that's just, that's not your indicator. Yeah. You know, um, you made a good point, which I think, uh, you know, I'm going to over iterate to people, which is your indicator was, do I find myself capable of making it viable and, and, you know, uh, pushing out, do I, am I in a place where I feel like I can, I can push off of, yeah. and, you know, get started and then just taking the bold leap. Yes. So what has been your experience when you've done that? Like, what did you do? Did you calculate financially oh, where yeah. you were? Um, did, have you found that like, did the calculation, were the calculations accurate? Where do you feel like in your journey so far um, that it's taking you? Do you feel like you are doing the things and what do you feel like has been like a mistake that you, you didn't know until like you got into it that you've had to like be creative around? Yeah, um, so I absolutely did like, I feel like a nice break for me from painting is running the business. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very soothed by how cut and dry <laughs> that part of it is. Mm -hmm. You've either done it or you haven't versus painting where one day I can look at a painting and be like, oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. then the next day I'll go back and be like, what am I doing? Yeah. Um, <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so as a part of like my prep to do this full time. Um, I, I did the math in terms of, okay, if I have this many commissions lined up and I know that we're looking at about this size, this minimum price for each of these commissions, and I can do about this many per month, what is my runway? You know, how much business have I booked out? Um, and I continue to run those numbers and do that calculation on like a weekly basis <laughs> to this great. day. Yeah. Wow, weekly basis. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I have a, a beautiful little spreadsheet. <laughs> You've got a PL spreadsheet for every week. I love <laughs> yeah. it. Um, at this point, it's all automated, so I just have to plug stuff in. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. That's awesome. Um, and I, I did do something that felt way too grown up, which was talking to a financial planner. Mm -hmm. Recently? Um, uh, before, I, before I took the leap. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I think like a really big takeaway from having done this was just, you just have to keep throwing stuff at the wall. Yeah. Like when I started the bread and butter in terms of like consistent income was from commissions. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got into teaching and really loved that and found that 
I don't know, it just like it fueled me in a different way. And I, that was also predictable revenue. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I shifted gears and based a lot of my security around that. Mm -hmm. um, but like I have tried and failed at so many different ways of creating consistency for myself. And when I talk to artists who like want to take the leap, one of the things that I wish I could convey is like, you can't put all your eggs in one basket and like yeah. it working this way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like I've had to be scrappy. Yep. Um, and you like, a, scrappy. yeah. And like adjusting very quickly when I realized that something isn't panning out the way that I expected. Right. Um, that was awesome. And, um, Man, really proud of you. That's, that's really great. Thank you. So a question from um, John Finnegan relating to this sort of business um, theme is, greetings from upstate South Carolina. More of a businessy question for you. Say you were starting East Oak Studio from scratch today. What is the number one piece of business advice you would give yourself? <sighs> Wow, um, that is a that's an intense question because you so so much of success, success is failure and you know and and I would I wouldn't even necessarily say this and I'm, I'm saying success in the business sense that we're hey we're still running <laughs> we're still we're still moving forward but. Um, you know, I think that the biggest the biggest thing is is to to make sure that you have a, a, a really strong we had a really strong game plan, um, and I would say making sure that you have really good direction. If I were to like talk to my younger self, but at the same time, always know that you need to that plans are going to change. An entrepreneur really is a person who is is okay being creative around change and realizing that what you start with, the product that you are starting with, might not be the product you're ending with, um, but it could actually be better. Um, and so as long as it's staying true to your vision. So strong vision statement, strong vision statement, a plan to start with and willing to change is what I would say. Um, and adapt is probably a better word than change. I find it really funny that you said um, you're talking about like mission and vision uh, just because those are like corporate buzzwords that came up so much in my <laughs> day job before I was doing this full time. And like, man, I <laughs> like found it so easy to like roll my eyes at so many aspects of corporate culture. And mm -hmm. now I'm so much more bought into those concepts yeah. now that I run my own business. Like I am so organized. Like yep. there's so many things like that that are just wild to me that like I just never would have thought that that's yeah. it's, it's it's you you realize quickly why, you know, it, yeah. it's it's not it's not easy. I, I'm a I'm a firm believer that no no business is easy. You, you've just gotten be willing to be creative and be willing to 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 um, be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And um, part of the nature of it is when it gets hard, you you have to go back on your values and your principle of why you're doing this in the first place, and really know your why, which is another big business buzzword, um, yeah. but one that I really firmly believe in because it's really helped me stay stay on track because there are many times where I'm like, gosh, why the heck am I doing this? You know, um, but part of the reason I'm doing this is because no, I grew up not having in this exist. And it has been invaluable to me to know that I'm providing something to somebody that was really, I couldn't find on my own. Um, so um, for those reasons, it, it's been it's been really great. Mm -hmm. Let me see what the time is too.
Gary LaPal says, and Chelsea, and she, Chelsea, is an awesome teacher. Oh, thank you, Gary. Gary, you're an awesome student. I tell you, you know, it's hard to find somebody that has a true heart of a teacher. You know, uh, I know so many people that do it just because they're trying to make, you don't know how any other way to make it work. Yeah. But if you love it, it, it is like so flipping rewarding. Yes. One, uh, what are your e what are each of your biggest weaknesses in your work currently that you're working to overcome? Is this a job not not <laughs> not this painting, but in the studio. Um, I would say my biggest weakness is is focus. Um, I have a lot of distractions in my life. Uh, especially because I'm running this whole thing and there, there's always a squeaky wheel and to get to the easel sometimes is almost like a fight. Yeah, that's real. Yeah. It's like a relief to hear you say that because I'm coming out of a very similar period of like the business is enough of a beast all on its own. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's, it's rewarding all on its own. Teaching yeah. is so great all on its own that there are times where I'm like, I don't, painting is hard. Like what if I yeah. make an absolute mess on the canvas? Um, and yeah, getting getting that push that you described is can be like really challenging. Um, oh yeah, okay. What is, well. I always, and I've realized that, like, let's say if we talk, go back to like, what you're talking about, knowing your why or, you know, what about this job that you like that keeps you motivated? And mine is, I think, being a student. Yeah. So I'm constantly always analyzing things like, we were, me and Divya were with our friends, Brett and Lisa, and I just, I brought up my painting and then a painting that was a very similar pose. And I'm like, why the hell is this one better? You know, I just mm -hmm. like really analyzing the hell out of it to figure out, you know, what is it? And, and you have to get through all the BS answers of like, but yours is so great. You need a painting like anyone else. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. You just got to. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. This is what I like yeah. to do. Um, so I mean like everything, but I, something that I've been doing recently is just trying to sharpen up my drawing skills. And by drawing, I mean like the concept of drawing, like getting the thing, the likeness, the proportions, like getting things accurate. Um, to the point where it becomes more intuitive because it's something that's just kind of really difficult for me and I get there eventually but want to speed up that process. I tell a lot of people that I'm a yes yeah, it's, it's a it's a track term but I think it works really well where I'm a slow starter but I'm a great anchor. <laughs> it, it takes me a really long time to get there but once I finally like find something then it's like a, you know it's game on and get there but it's like you said it's a slow process to find it that's good stuff Alex I was interested to hear you say that um you know you you have to get through somebody looking at it and then saying it's great um and to my untrained eye, I mean the three of you are such extraordinary painters and I was just wondering how you get past that how, you know does praise hamstring you as much as criticism? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, hearing a bunch of good things 
is yeah it's hard because some you start you can feel yourself maybe starting to believe it a little bit or maybe you know you or you can see other artists that be like oh maybe they got a little bit, bit too much success and now they're just riding on that and mm -hmm. not pushing their student kind of mentality enough so yeah i mean that's that's one thing my uh gallery the gallery that i work with the owner was like don't read the comments yeah because oh, everyone's yeah. going to tell you that you're a genius yeah 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 uh, that can be a career killer <laughs> yeah um because then, then you know, I heard somebody say one time that he doesn't like considering himself a professional because it it implies in his head that that uh, he's he is learning is beneath him, and you know, even though that a professional is most certainly not that. I mean, that's why physicians, you know, his his work is called a practice, but but uh, there is a mental switch that you can get pigeonholed into a certain thing and that's your identity and people praise you for it and then sometimes you'll stop growing so reversing the question what and you know this might be tough to answer but what do you think your individual strengths are in painting and it can be something small or specific <sighs> I think I'm really good at looking at paintings. <laughs> like, mm, man, I got some great taste. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I'm very good at that as well. I, I mean, the way I think I look at that because it's it's easy to like get into like I don't want to sound boastful to about like what what you are, but I also think that you you have to total line of being confident in what you're capable of doing, but also humble enough to know that there, there's just no way you'll ever learn uh, about anything fully um, and sort of like living in that humility, but also the confidence. Um, so uh, that being said is like, I don't think that it's, it's sort of, sometimes I feel like it's a faux pas to say that we are even painters because even sometimes I've heard somebody say, well, I'm a painter, but I'm not an artist. I think that you know? was Divya who said that. Oh, Divya said that? I I have some memory of like an Instagram post where you were talking about like identifying as like a craftsperson versus an artist. Well, look at that. That Well, the, I think the person that that's interesting that it said, it, I think it was, um, I was at a conference or a, um, a portrait, a Portraits Inc gathering and a guy said it there but then people and so like everybody else after that one main guy who's like super figure in the art world said it and and everybody was like oh i can't call myself now an artist because he, <laughs> he's he's like i'm not an artist i'm a painter and it's like no i think that we inspire or strive to to create art and the the fact that we're not perfect or a master at it doesn't necessarily mean that we don't have to consider ourselves one. Uh, it means that we're a pursuer in that field, you know, and that's okay. Um, so I was saying that to say something else. I forgot what it was. <laughs> no, that's okay. Oh, what's wrong? I think it looks like a painting. Hmm. Yeah, there's some colors on there. <laughs> Does yours feel like a painting? <laughs> yeah, uh, not so much person. Oh, not that brush. I don't know how 
you all stand while you paint. I have some muscular imbalance thing. That means this, I just need to like relax my back as soon as. Eight oh four. When do you sleep? <laughs> we are back. And uh, hold on just a second. We're going to work on one sound thing. All of y'all can go ahead and get started. In. Oh my god, if I could study my hand, that'd yep. be great. Mm -hmm. There. Yeah. The first F bomb. Hmm? The first F bomb. <laughs> Is this what we're going to put in the drinking game? <laughs> Leah Tawari says the great Wayne Theobald used to tell people he was in the oil business as opposed to saying he was an artist. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like people would assume you make a lot of money <laughs> if you yeah, tell if them you're, you're, you're in the oil business. Yep. <laughs> that, yeah. So Chelsea, um, Mina asks, Chelsea, could you please share what colors you are using for the model's nostrils? Thanks. Um, yeah, this is a combination of Michael Harding cad orange, which is like a deeper cad orange. Um, and then I believe I have a little bit of Windsor Newton permanent rose in that mixture. Um, it is definitely a bit more impressionistic and warm than what's on the model. Um, but I just thought we would try out something Thank a little impressionistic. Yeah. yeah, love that. But yeah, I usually give myself permission to tend towards something hotter in those like very thin skinned areas of, um, of the figure or the face, like, like the nose or lips or fingertips or ears. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you look at a lot, a lot of old master paintings, that's, that's the way they do it for a lot of those and really lovely. Chelsea, before when you were, you remembered a quote that I shared. Um, yeah, like, it's funny. I shared that quote. I think I vaguely remember. I think, like, I think it was the Odd Nerdrum quote about, like, the painters, like a, like a carpenter or just something like that. And I remember an artist who I won't name, but like a really well-known uh, well artist had like a big problem with the quote and it was like trying to debate me on like, no, a painter's a painter, like we're not carpenters. And I was, it was interesting. I was like, huh, this, this quote like really affected the person. Um, but yeah, I feel like the Nerdrum, the sort of Nerdrum philosophy is kind of a bit like thinking about painting in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I like that a lot. 
I like the idea that we show up and engage in a craft. It lowers the stakes tremendously. Mm. Um, and I feel like the stakes can always be lower when I'm painting because <laughs> sometimes it can feel like yeah. you're on a live stream with two amazing painters and all these people are watching. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he has some other quote, like, I have a hammer and I use the hammer. I don't stare and think about the hammer or something. <laughs> just also relating it, just get to work. Yeah. So another uh, daft question from the model's husband. Uh, the last time we were here um, and you, you guys were painting one of Madeline's floral arrangements, I'd asked the question of um, if it was more difficult to paint something beautiful or to paint something ugly. Uh, and I won't ask if it's easier to paint a beautiful person or an ugly person, but I, uh, <laughs> I was wondering if it's more challenging to um, maybe paint like a really young person or a child or an older person with a lot of character on his or her face? Um, and if your approach to those changes, depending on your subject. That's a nice softball question. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was really hard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be embarrassed if I get contradicted here, but I feel like it is universally easier to paint people who have a lot of character in their face, um, specifically like a lot of harder edges in their face um, and very difficult to paint someone who's very young or just very feminine in their features uh, because you can very easily go awry with your edges and inadvertently age the model really dramatically or just create a really unflattering effect. I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, as a person who paints a lot of children for a living and have painted many adults too, it is much, much easier to um, paint the character. There's things that are challenging on both that are different, but, um, but especially, I, I tell people all the time that one of the hardest things that I do is have to paint a five-year-old from life and try to capture a likeness because they're jumping around all over the places and they have these like soft, subtle shifts in their form that are just so difficult to sometimes capture. So um, that being said, yes, it's, it, is, it can be incredibly difficult to, um, which is funny because like I would say in the, in the painting world, you know, the, the, the child portrait is probably the one that doesn't get as much respect because it's it's kind of where you make your living. You know, some people would be like, "This is kind of like the sellout thing," but it actually is probably one of the most difficult things to paint. I think so. I appreciate that you frame it that way because you're absolutely right. I guess it's not a place where we're often very like we're usually not making a big ideological statement with those pieces, mm -hmm. but yeah, they like, I can't really think of anything harder unless you had a painting full of hands or yeah. horses or yeah, totally. something. Um, does what season does everyone sort of feel like they're most they're the most productive because I was reflecting today that I honestly feel like I'm more productive with painting in winter and I feel like it's because I don't have that like FOMO to like go outside and go hiking and explore I mean I do as still but it's like different so I just feel that I'm more focused in winter so I was just curious yeah when when what season does everyone feel like they're most productive in Hmm. Uh, prob probably, probably the the winter, but it's for a different reason. <laughs> it's because usually I have a lot of Christmas deadlines, <laughs> and I'm trying to 
meet all the deadlines that I'm far behind on. <laughs> um, so I'm probably most productive because it's crunch time. What about you, Alex? Um, I don't know. Oh, that's hard. I, I feel the winter thing as well, but I feel like I paint better when my mood's better. Yeah. And if the weather is nice, I just feel nice. Yeah. But, but then, yes, I do want to be outside. So, but if I can get myself to stay inside, I think I paint better and more productive, I guess. Maybe a sweet spot like in the spring or something. I'm super envious. My like painting is so heavily tied to my mood and like it is rough right now. Oh, Just yeah. 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 It's weird. Sometimes I feel like when I'm in a good mood, I paint worse. Well, I mean, I don't know. Alex would know. <laughs> but um <laughs> with the mood like if the painting's not going well then it's not a good mood anyway <laughs> what were you saying but yeah <laughs> no yeah it's interesting because it's like you want that kind of sweet um stable focused place but if you're too happy you're like I want to do something, you know, different. So it's an interesting thing. It's almost like that sweet spot with drinking caffeine. <laughs> it is interesting that you put it that way. I feel like I often have like more ideas for paintings when I'm like not in a great place. Yeah, sometimes when like everything is great, I'm like, I don't know what to paint. Like, I just, I guess I don't feel like I have anything to, to have to like, get out of me, mm. but. We have a question from Gail Knowles. After you finish or think you are finished with a painting, how often do you go back and change something or add something? How often do I want to change something <laughs> or add something? <laughs> oh, every time. Uh, but to answer your question, um, I would say how often do I actually probably 50% of the time. There's sometimes where luckily the deadline controls controls you from not like going too far down that line, you know? Um, but yeah, what about you guys? Hmm. I feel like I usually, usually I feel most of the time when it's done, it's done for me. But I, I think that's just because it was so deadline driven. Um, but yeah, most of the time. I, well, right now I've been doing a lot of working on a lot of different stuff, but usually it's like one thing till the end, call it done, and then move on. So. Yeah. Yeah, I I think I've had to kind of in the spirit of like continuously learning, really had to force myself to be okay with where I am today mm -hmm. and not try and be, not try and think of it in terms of being a better painter than I am today, which is I think a mindset that can sort of unconsciously creep in. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have to really actively fight to say like, no, it's, it's okay. That's where that painting was. Go make another one now. Yep. and apply that thing that you really wanted to put into that painting <laughs> in, into the next one. I think that's really smart. Thank you. Sometimes I can worry it's laziness, so. <laughs> uh, what, well, we talk a lot about here, and Divi and I have talked about it quite a few times. It's, it's like a little parable I tell about, I had a pottery teacher, and he would say that he had a, he had, a set of students and he said okay i want you can either for the semester make 100 pots yeah. or you can make one perfect pot yep. and you get to decide right now and the students that would make the 100 pots that didn't have to be perfect inevitably made a much prettier pot 
by the end of the semester than the one that could try to make a perfect pot. Yeah. And um, and so sometimes there's there's learning in all 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 sections of the process. And so by by pushing yourself to to see past just the one stage that you're trying to correct, you actually learn better how to correct the stage in in the process in the present. Hence, great a la prima. I learned a lot about my layer painting stuff from my a la prima stuff. I really love how everyone's going about painting Madeline's hair, um, beautiful mermaid hair. Mm -hmm. I, haven't on the face yet. I haven't started on the face yet. I'm just only <laughs> still just working on everything else, avoiding it at all costs. <laughs> so, oh, sorry, you go, Chelsea. That's right. Oh, yeah, that hadn't happened yet for me. <laughs> That's going to be a while. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an artist, but I can't pay a good signature. I tried to sign a, a master copy on Monday um, and realized that I've only figured out how to say my name in paint like just trying to write like after and then the artist name. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I probably did like six passes and it still looks terrible. <laughs> Gotta go back to like third grade and learn cursive again, just with paint. Love it. So um, Gail Knoll says, do you prefer to work on a number of paintings at one time or one from start to finish? We know. We know your answer to that, Jesse, don't we? <laughs> well, actually, you said that there's times where you do you do come back to it. Yeah. Even though it's more I've shifted. I used to intentionally rotate through because I, I try and really be sensitive to when I'm getting diminishing returns. It's yep. so, like I fight the urge to paint just because the model's there, right. for, for instance. Um, and so earlier, when my painting approach was a little drier, Mm -hmm. Actually, it's funny because now this is very dry, brushy, but it is more a la prima than it used to be. Um, I would intentionally rotate through so I could stay fresh. Um, but since then, I've, I have learned how to paint faster to the point where that's not necessary anymore. Mm -hmm. Why did I grab this brush? Yeah. <laughs> I ask that question all the time. <laughs> So recently I've discovered that as well as painting, Alex is in extremely good at rock climbing, climbing boulders. It was, it's like this natural talent that just came out of nowhere. <laughs> and I was very impressed as we did a crazy hike with our friends, Brett and Lisa. And um, no joke, Alex bolted up this mountain that was just full of boulders. It was a, like a boulder rock hike. And <laughs> he was like, uh, he got to the top and he was like, I found my calling. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably like, I don't know, 500 painters who are like, I'll take Alex's spot. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. But it wasn't one of those things where I was like, oh, yeah, he was good. It was like he was insanely good to the point where you were like, have you been secretly doing this for a long time? Because I, I mean, he was waiting for us for about, you know, 30, 40 minutes. So, yeah, I just covered that last week. That was 
well. We were, we were talking about how when you see something in your spouse that you've been with forever that you really didn't, like you had no clue was there, and then all of a sudden it's like you've learned something brand new about them. You're like, I thought I knew all the, the main <laughs> things, you know? Um, that's kind of fun. That's it. Yeah. I also feel like um, with the rock climbing thing, Alex was saying that, and Alex, you can if you feel like, but just that it was like a puzzle piece and it was kind of like using your mind to understand what rock to step to. And it almost sounded like he was analyzing how to paint, you know? Mm. Yeah, it was cool. Just, just like step by step, which is the right move to get you to like the end to where you're trying to go. Yeah, it was kind of, it was cool. It was how I've heard, um, we've watched some rock climbing movies or documentaries. And one guy described it that like, because you're making all these decisions, it shuts off everything else in your brain. All the nonsense. Yeah. I'm like, maybe that, you're good. Maybe that's what was happening. Yeah. All right, everybody, we'll take uh, one more break. Uh, and, oh, actually, we'll have a, a one and change. So we'll talk, we'll be back. So everyone just had to leave early. So, uh, but we prom we we made sure to promise that she promised to come back and get this again. Um, and then y'all enjoyed her so we so. Now. The real question is, is we only have a session and a half left. What are the things that are important? Yeah. What are the things that are important, Alex? <laughs> Family. Right. Loved ones. Right. Your, your, your secret lover. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my secret girlfriend. She's important. I just usually don't bring her up. Well, there's also just family, family quarrel right here. Girlfriend, I saw what you put to who you texted out. Yeah, that would be hard with sharing a phone. Yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, I left all this space to be able to fit like the shawl and everything, and I'm still up here hanging out in Porter. It's hard to one of these things. Yeah. So, Alex, were you going for that kind of approach where you start with the 
middle tone and then sort of gradually add darks and lights? Yeah, that's what I was trying to do. And like right now I'm adding a few lighter moments, but it was a bit harder because I had so much kind of shadow side. So it was like, do I find the middle tone of the shadow or do I just put in the shadow? But yeah, I was trying to go after that a little bit. Awesome, man. I'm really quiet. Did everybody leave on YouTube? <laughs> okay. I'm glad y'all are chilling with us, even if you're not asking any questions. That's cool, too. We're all chilling together. So I know this question won't really be very instructive for people who are tuning in to learn how to paint, but I was just wondering, uh, since my wife is the model, if you have any nightmare model stories, uh, you don't have to name names but uh, any really lousy experiences that you've had with the model. And, uh, and, and adding on to that, Alex, I feel that Alex has got a, a very gold one. Alex, you go first. Oh, well, I'm <laughs> scared. The model story, just to let you know. I'm scared she could listen to this one day. <laughs> um, how did it start? because it started before she even got here. Um, I just remember I had to get her to send me a picture of herself because I thought I was being catfished by like an older man or something. And, and I, but I'm trying to remember why. <laughs> and then she sent me a selfie, I was like, okay. Oh, <laughs> now I remember why. This is an important part of the story. She was telling me she was going to be late. And if you're listening to this, I'm sorry, you're a very nice person. But she told me she was going to be late because she was on the toilet. And she was just blowing up the toilet. And she's, and she's writing these words to me. Like, I'm, she's basically like, I'm shitting my brains out right now. I'm like, I don't know you. Why are you telling me this? <laughs> and... <laughs> so then I was like, can you prove you're real? And I think the photo was from the toilet. Um, but, she, <laughs> but she was real. And then she came and she was, you know, she was a fun personality. Um, she was modeling nude, but she was like, I'm going to go, I need to go ask the girls if they have a tampon. And was like, went upstairs to these total strangers, you know, asking for tampons and just really loud and fun. Was, but the poop thing, that was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was taking photos in my bed too. So it was just like all of this added to like funny stuff. Yeah, it's hard to beat that. <laughs> <laughs> but she was a lovely person. Um, no, my my model stories aren't nearly that good. They're usually because the model just had a hard time uh, posing. But we we you know when I was at uh, GCA in New York, which is Spring Central Radio, for those of you who don't know, um, you know you had a model every day. Posing. And some of these people are professionals. That's like what they do. You know? um, and uh, and so like I we would have we had this one girl come in, and she would be standing there, and she I promise you she fell asleep every single session. And one day we we're sitting there, and um, she fell asleep, and we were all kind of like, now there's a rule at. GCA that only the model uh, coordinator can say something to her because there was like all these incidents where people would just be like, ah, mm -hmm. you know, and say, you know, mean things. 
So like we had to like, you know, try to bring, reel it in. And so the model coordinator left and like, we're all just kind of like sitting there. I don't know if they like went to the restroom or something. They were gone for a while and she fell asleep and all of a sudden she started snoring. <laughs> and we were like, is this happening right now? Should we say something? Like, you know, and so we were like caught between like the policy of the school and um, what we thought might be, you know, free to say, hey, look, we're trying to draw you and you're completely out of pose because she's like sliding down, you know. So um, it's like not as good as a good story. Good stories always went out. You can just make a really loud noise. Yeah. Wow! Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> it was a mosquito on my canvas. It scared me. It was a spider. <laughs> that actually would be pretty funny. I have like the tiniest amount of like green and yellow on my top. I didn't even try to get as much out of it as possible here. <laughs> Um, I actually might be down in the last pose. Last five pages. Uh, we have a comment from um, the outside world. As, I, love, I love how you're like, oh, oh, we got one. <laughs> <laughs> she said, SVV, I had a model once for a competition that decided to play guitar mid-session. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, guys, you got to hear this. You got to hear this. Hold on. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Then um, Gary LaPal says, tell Chelsea that my pain along is laughable, but I'll post it to Discord so she can have a good laugh as well. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks for painting along, though. And that, that was from Gary LaPal, if I didn't say that. So, Luce, when you have a a lot of canvas left there uh, with a clock ticking, <laughs> how are you deciding what your attention lands on and doing justice to the work that you've already done to it versus getting more down? I get very tempted to cut it. <laughs> yeah, you know, that part's really great. I'll just crop it and just cut it all. Um, that's part of that, and, and that is a, that's a real solution. <laughs> but uh, when it comes down to this, I want to like make it brushy. But the one thing is, is like, uh, like for example, the hand. Um, it's like I'm. I also am thinking about like pulling it through and just matching the hand not there because I wouldn't have time to 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 go there. And so, um, but I'll probably end up kind of bringing this across at the next break. Uh, and bringing the shawl in, I might go upstairs and get my lemon yellow really quick on this last break, and then just like make it nice and brushy and pull it pull it down to where it's gonna be. Um, and I think that's how I'll finish it out. And you want things to be brushy as they go outward, so um, that's probably how I'll you know, uh, solve that little. So um, a question from figurative artist Benjamin Lester. Have any of you used a, pro a projector, be honest, lol, and how do you feel about using them? Sure, I definitely have used a projector before. Um, 
four PowerPoints? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I, my, my thing there is the, you, you must use things. Um, it's easy to make things a crutch. And it's easy to, you know, you can use them as a tool or you can use them as a crutch. I have most certainly used them in crunch time when I am so behind on paintings and I'm trying to play catch up that I will I'll use a projector to uh, get rid of blocking stage. Uh, but I will will say that part of that it takes some of the fun out of painting. And, and, uh, at least for me, uh, part of the challenge is to to gain the likeness. But the one thing I will say is that it's it ha it is helpful at times because what what people are wanting is not just how I draw, but how my uh, mark making and my color choices and how I handle the brush. So, uh, and I've had a lot of training in drawing. And so I don't think I use it because I can't draw. I use it because I'm trying to, like, you know, I'm trying to meet a deadline or something. So. And I believe Alex is a purist. I don't think he does, right? Yeah, I don't. Um, but I could see if I was mainly working on commissions I feel like I would be tempted so Gail, Gail Noll says how do you decide what kind of background you are going to use on a portrait mm. um, I mean that changes every every time I think it's just honestly, it's 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 usually if I see that there's a painting that inspires me that I'm thinking in my head, I'll try to figure out ways to to find a similar way to paint it. Um, but you know, if there's like an old master painting that I think of, um, but if it's just a colored background, often it might be what 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 colors the light that's hitting them and what is a beautiful you know harmonious complement to what I'm seeing. Yeah, usually I have some kind of I you know idea of a color harmony I want. Well and I guess sometimes compositionally I'm thinking do I want a dark background with a like a very you know light prominent figure, or do I want the figure to kind of silhouette a light background? Um, so a lot of that, yeah, I'm deciding first, and can be based on, and like I'm trying to I'm trying to paint an answer for a question. Yeah. I'm like forgetting what we're talking about. Um, but yeah, if I have an idea for kind of like a light background, I'll see what I have, or I'll have a color idea in mind, like something I want to do soon is I have this idea of kind of this red and neutral green as the kind of main color elements of my painting. And so sometimes the color of the background is like the main idea for a painting anyway. There you go. There you go. <laughs> oh. Should we do so, that? everyone who has been waiting this whole time for the announcement and <laughs> for <laughs> still with us. Um, uh, Alex will be doing teaching a live stream workshop for East Oaks next month, yep. every Wednesday. Um, Alex, tell us a little bit about it. What are you planning on doing? Yeah, so it's going to be once a week um, next month. 
And I wanted to be able to show, and because I live here, it's easy to do a, a uh, once a week thing instead of you know having to travel somewhere and do having to do every day. So I wanted to really be able to show my process of just kind of like my first, you know, my layer that I let dry and then paint on top of and then let that dry and paint on top of so my layered indirect process to painting. And I'll be doing the complete drawing to going on into like the nuance of what a finished layer should, you know, look like and yeah, I'm excited. Excited to uh, do another video, another portrait from life. Yeah, it's been amazing, y'all. I'm really excited about having you do another one. So, super stoked. So, yeah. Join us next next month. Um, yeah, every forward, Wednesday. Every Wednesday, if you want more to information seven. about it, uh, go to bustokestudio.com. And there'll be more information there for you. Um, and check it out. We'll also continue to do more announcements as well um, as the week progresses, as far as that's concerned. And we're going to do something interesting with, um, with painting from life in the future. So stay tuned for that. Um, and on the next break, we're going to also um, show one of our little promo videos. So hang out for the next break, and you'll you'll get a taste of something that we're going to start trying to do for entertainment during the next break. So, all right, we're going to take another quick break. We have about five minutes. Composition, you always have to think about three major values. Art is way more than just learning the techniques, but it most certainly is crucial and essential to have those. For Lu Jim Alexander, for Lewis, are you planning to return to Florence Studio to teach another workshop? Oh, uh, I would love to. I um, I need to call them and work out a date because uh, I had one set and then the pandemic hit and life got crazy. Um, so, uh, but yes, I would, I would. It would be a dream to go back. You know, I've lived in Italy for a little while, and so. Uh, it had a special place in my heart, so in some way, shape, or form, I'd love to continue to have ways of being, going back. Alex, are you, are you painting in the hand at all? No. Okay. How about you take your hand down that way? Yeah, that way I can, because um, it was just too much that far to do with three hours. 
Um, so someone said, nice commercial. Uh, awesome. And then she also said, um, MM Bog 00, beautiful paintings this evening. Thank you. Leah Tawari says, love East Stokes for the wealth of art instruction you have available. Also, I've decided to do this model th this model with a Veraccio Imprimatura for a change of pace. Veraccio. Yeah, she, she referenced it earlier when you weren't oh, here. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. Get that whole pre raphael feel. Bring it around in the end. Um, I tell you, you know, doing these things, it's fun to do something so different because it just like, in a way, it reminds you of why you love painting so much. You know, it just gives you an opportunity to try new things. And, Back into experiment and discover new things. That's what I'd say if my painting was going good too, Louie. <laughs> I thought I saw some badass going good there. Let me put some kind of eye in. Beautiful shot. Did you say you got this uh, scarf recently? Mm -hmm. Eric? Honey, <laughs> that's your cue. Uh, yeah, so Madeline, um, with her floral business, just uh, got a studio space. And a, uh, a friend of hers, Mina, who is uh, also a very gifted photographer, uh, got her the scarf as a sort of housewarming gift for her studio Aww. space that she, Madeline mm -hmm. is currently working very hard at um, renovating. So she spent most of this day uh, in paint, but it was because she was painting the walls. And so now it's funny to see her being painted. <laughs> That's a nice friend to get that special yeah, gift. So One of my favorite places to shop. <laughs> Um, Priest and I love going to the state sales. One of our things. <laughs> um, how's this new studio? Or oh, well, you guys just settled in there. Yes, uh, she just got the keys and was in there for the first day, two days ago, um, and so starting to put things together and uh, our house will go back to a, a state of normalcy uh, without as many flowers and everything in it. So, <laughs> and it, luckily it's right down the road from where we live. Oh, that's awesome. It is, yeah. Uh, we love Raleigh. We love all of you here, but we are Durhamites. <laughs> uh, um, go ahead and plug the name and spell out the like, Instagram and everybody for any dermites that might be listening. Sure. Yeah. Madeline's floral business is called Mood Floriste. Um, and she is on Instagram. Uh, she's also at moodfloriste.com. Uh, if you, like me, don't speak French, it's M O O D F L E U R I S T E. Uh, and that's her Instagram handle uh, as well as the website. Um, and I am very biased, but I think she does the most beautiful floral arrangements. And I would prefer, and that is why we've used her so many times a year. It sounds like just like Chelsea, you, you fell into it because you had a completely different profession. Um, one point and switched over to being more florist or, or, or you sort of dual the vocational still mm -hmm. yeah. or bivocational yeah, full time almost one month ago. Oh wow so this is recent that you're full time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. 
when it rains, it pours in <laughs> the studio space and I don't want it. Yeah, totally. And it's cheap and full of light. What was that, Madeline's job before that? Economics division at the state. Um, mm -hmm. So she worked in a lab. Did Chelsea tell you guys that she used to um, do uh, professional um, dancing? Or dancing, yeah. Like sure ballroom sort of stuff. Um, like quite competitively. Um, which is super interesting. It sounds like she's lived a full young life so far. <laughs> I. Uh, uh, well, I uh, when I modeled years ago for um, Aaron Westerberg's workshop, I she was there and that's how we met. And she on the break she would kind of do these like interesting moves, and I was like, "Did you used to do ballroom dancing?" Because like and she, yeah, so that was cool. Mm, that's awesome. Never, I never see someone, someone in a workshop environment. Not that I've really done any, but. I never see someone do that. These kind of little moves while they're painting. Well, she's probably looking for another dance partner to come join her. <laughs> <laughs> Near the edge. Wednesday nights, anyone's interested? She was so much fun to have. Like, she came super glad that she decided to paint up, you know, because at first she was thinking, uh, I might just, you know, watch and hang out. And then, no, man, so glad she painted. Right. Everybody agreed to be here for another three hours. So I hope everybody's cool with the live stream continuing. Everybody's like, uh uh, best jokes are not even hitting landing right now. <laughs> Brenda Mercado says, I'm off to work and you are still live. Oh, thank you for continuing to live demo. Thanks. Thanks, you. Oh, nice. Thank you for watching. We really appreciate it. And I um, uh, hope, uh, hope work, the work day is a good one. I have a question. What is the earliest you've ever started painting in the hours of the morning? <laughs> um, that's probably probably four thirty. Um, but you know that's that's not common. Um, but what is common is probably I would say like seven is common. Seven thirty. Um, and then every now and again, you can see six, six thirty. When I was in New York, I, painted, I definitely painted, uh, started at six every morning. But uh, <clears throat> in my old age, <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Um... 
Rhino Q Demon. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting, yeah, people sort of work peak um, hours because I know that Scott Burdick wake, wakes up really early, like 4 a.m. and then writes for a, a few hours and then might paint, but he's definitely an early riser to work. Yeah. Yeah, Scott and I have similar blood. I always say that I, had, I have farmer's blood because, you know, I grew up on a farm and we, we were up every morning and uh, crazy hours to, to work in the fields. So um, we've got 334 every morning to, to beat the heat for getting in the cotton fields. And uh, we'd stop work at like one in the afternoon because the heat would get so bad. So, um, so yeah, it, it kind of trains, trains you. Wow. I feel like since being around you and living with you, I feel like me and Alex have slowly, slowly been more morning people. Yeah. Like woken up like every year, like a little bit early. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's kind of been fun to see this sort of the transition because it used to be that y'all were like super night owls. I, th I still think that y'all probably stay up laid a decent amount of um, or it's easy for you to at least oh yeah for me it's brutal to stay up late i can't i can't even think straight um, Alex, did you say oh yeah to that it's easy for you to stay up late yeah. totally Alex's entire family are night owls. Yeah, they just watch TV until like 4 a.m. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, this is why that's my natural tendency. Yeah. Makes sense. So, um, Brendan Mas Masado Mikado says, seriously, thank you. Then she says, I often send my painting before I start a new session. I learned this from Bo Bartlett. I can keep the edges soft. I love how Alex builds the soft edges as he goes. Thank you. Yeah, I always want to be someone who sands my painting, but I don't know if I... Maybe I don't paint thick enough or I just don't make my ground dark enough. It just never works. Well, that's interesting. I didn't know that Bo Bartlett um, said. Yeah. All right, everyone, that's, that's a wrap. Um, gosh, thank y'all so much for, for coming and modeling for us. It's been amazing. Um, I truly appreciate it for everyone who uh, hung hung in there till the bitter end for us this evening. So, yeah. um, just a quick announcement: remember Alex's workshop for uh, East Oak Studio next month, every Wednesday night. And um, you know, tune in. We'll be doing another another painting from life next month. And next month, we're probably going to start uh, doing some new and interesting things with it. So I'm really, really excited about what might be in the future for Pain for Life. So it's going to continue to evolve uh, to help be entertaining and enjoyable for y'all and a lot of fun for us to produce. So until next time, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah.